Father in heaven, God, we are grateful for an opportunity to come before you in prayer. And we want to say thank you for this beautiful day of life that you've blessed us with. You are our creator and our redeemer, and we're here praising your name. We are also so thankful for the word that you've preserved for us down through time, that we may know you more, that we may understand what a wonderful God we have. Father, please give us understanding today. Send your Holy Spirit to us and be our teacher. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I would like to start by sharing with you a verse from Isaiah chapter 46 and verses 9 and 10. You may have heard it before. Here's what God says. He's the one who's speaking. Here's what he says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, says the Lord. What is God claiming to be able to do in Isaiah chapter 46 verses 9 and 10? He can see into the future. It's really an amazing thing to be able to, I mean, can, how, how, many, how are you guys doing on your, uh, on your seeing into the future idea? Can you do that? Are you successful at doing that? Most of us are very unsuccessful at doing that. In fact, there have been many prophets who are more successful, but I've been very poor at this. In fact, I even sometimes try to predict what my wife is going to do in response to something I do, and I'm terrible at it. I am just not a prophet. It's not what I do. But God says he can. And in fact, there is another reason. In fact, I think it's probably the primary reason that God actually gives us prophecy, or you might call it predictive prophecy, and it is given there in John chapter 14 and verse 29. It says simply, Jesus speaking, I have told you before it comes to pass, so that after it passes, you may believe. I want you to just realize that one more time again. Jesus says, I told you before it comes to pass, so that after it passes, you may what? Believe. One of the reasons, one of the primary reasons God gives us prophecy is so that we may have a firm foundation for our faith. That is one of the reasons that I love prophecy. I absolutely love it. And today, we are not going to do the super in-depth version. We're going to do the big overview version. And there is a reason that I'm doing this. It does connect with the seven churches. We're just going to get there in a roundabout sort of way. And so some of this will be review if you've heard it before. And some of it will be potentially new to you. If it's new to you, I want to encourage you and, and, and let you know that the one big takeaway that I want you to absolutely not forget is that Jesus told you all these things and showed you the proof of predictive prophecy so that you would what? Believe. He wants you to have a firm foundation for faith. Faith is not a blind faith in the Bible. It's a faith based on those things that God has revealed. Now, if, if you have heard these things before, I hope we're connecting some dots today. Either way, if you want more information, I have resources I can give you. I would even be so happy as to study the Bible personally with you if you were interested in that. And there are probably other people in the congregation who would be willing to do that as well if you're just not wanting to meet with the pastor for some reason. I don't know why, but whatever the case is, there is willingness at least. So don't let this be the final conversation on that. Now, I want to start again by introducing a topic. I know it's small, but you're going to see more, it, I'm revealing more as we go, okay? So that's the way we're doing this. Now, how many of you have heard the story in Daniel chapter 2 before of the multi-metal man, right? You remember the story, Nebuchadnezzar is the king of Babylon, and he is, uh, well, he's a very important person back in his day. And he has a dream, and Babylonians believe that if you understood the dream, it could be a blessing. If you didn't understand the dream, it could be a curse. And so he has this dream, but he forgets, and he's a little hot-tempered, and he tells all of his wise men, you better tell me, or else. You know where or else goes, right? It's not like they're going to get spanked. It's like they're going to get chopped up into pieces, and their houses are going to be burned. This dude had a temper. I'm glad we don't necessarily have rulers like that now, if we decide... Something is not in line. I don't know. I maybe. I maybe. We're, I don't know. I hope we don't. Hope nobody feels our rulers are like that nowadays. Um, but whatever the case is, he felt very strongly about this, and Daniel was one of the wise men. And so Daniel actually said, "Give me a little bit of time." And what did he do with his time? Do you remember? He went and he had a prayer meeting with his friends. If you're ever in trouble, what's something that you can do? 
We even in Sabbath school this morning with the little kids, we were talking about this. If you're ever in trouble, if you're ever in trouble, Brian's just testing me. Brian, if you're ever in trouble, what is something you can do? Pray. Daniel did that. And God gave him the same dream and the interpretation. He then went to the king, and the first thing he said to the king, after saying it had nothing to do with him, right? It was all glory to God. He then said, you, O king, are that head of gold. That was pretty amazing. The king probably, because the king had, have you ever forgotten a dream before? And then something reminds you of the dream later, and you're like, ah! And the thing starts to come back to you. You say, I remember. Well, the king was in that same sort of situation where he, had, he didn't really remember, but now it's starting to come back to him. He says, you saw an image, and the head was gold. Now, was the image all gold? It wasn't. So it, that first part, the head, was representing the kingdom of Babylon. Each one is a successive kingdom. They're different metals. And then it follows with a chest and arms of silver. Now, you can read about the downfall of Babylon... That happens in chapter 5 of Daniel, where the Medes and the Persians come and take over. The Medes and the Persians were, were an uneven power. The Persians were more powerful than the Medes, and they, but they, they were able to combine together and take over Babylon. It's quite a story. You guys should probably read it in chapter 5. It's, it's, it's excellent. But Daniel said there wasn't going to be Medo-Persia forever. There was going to be a third kingdom who's going to have sway over all the earth. Do you remember what metal that was? Oh, you didn't know you were coming for a quiz today, did you? It's bronze. And or brass, and there was the belly and thighs of bronze or brass, which is uh, typically looked at as the kingdom of Greece, who took over after Medo-Persia. You remember, probably you've seen movies or heard about their first king. Do you remember who the first king of Greece was? He was very great. In fact, we had a young man who recently did a history project on him, right? What was his name, Nemo? Alexander the Great. He was the first and most notable of the Greek Grecian kings. And he then pushed all the way from over here in the west all the way down to the east into India, and in a very swift manner conquered basically all of the Medo-Persian Empire. I mean, it was really magnificent how that went down. Then there was a fourth kingdom that Daniel foresaw. Do you remember what the legs were made of? They were made of iron, and the iron was to represent the, the, other, the next kingdom that would take over after Greece. It was going to be the king, kingdom of Rome. And it said it would crush out all these things. Keep in mind, it's Rome. That'll show up again in the future. But something different was going to happen with Rome. It wasn't going to be taken over. Daniel said it would be divided. If you look at history, you'll see something very interesting does happen. Up from over here in the east and the north, you see barbarian tribes come. I mean, we call them barbarian because that's just what history calls them. But... You know, it's us, basically, right? Germanic tribes, right? Maybe be a better word for it. It's the Anglo-Saxons and the Franks and the Burgundians and the Suevi and the, right? You, you go through all of those. It's those the countries that make up Europe. They came down and they settled. And eventually, after the ones that were actually settled, there was 10 divisions of Rome. Divided up, not taken over, but divided up. And Daniel went further and he said, they would never stick back together. People would try to stick them back together through war and through intermarriage but it would never work. And even to this day, Europe has, has had many failed reconstructions of the Roman Empire. You understand you have people like Napoleon Bonaparte trying to recreate this grand, you know, one nation in, in Europe. And then you had, even through intermarriage, people were trying to do that. This cousin marries that cousin, this sister marries that cousin, whatever, all that stuff, right? It didn't work. Even, even Hitler tried to create the Third Reich, which is supposed to be this renewed Roman Empire. But did it work? Every time it ran into a roadblock because God had said these things would never stick back together. And that's exactly what happened. Now, the image was not the only thing that Nebuchadnezzar saw in his dream. There was one other thing. Do you remember what the other thing was that he saw in the dream? It was a great big rock cut out without hands. And he said that that represented the coming of the kingdom. And not only would that rock come and hit the, the, the image on the feet at the end of this timeline that's been pre preserved for us, but that the rock would actually grow into a kingdom that would, be the, that would take over the entire world. And that was the kingdom of God. And you think, wow, this is amazing. When did God say this stuff was going to happen? Daniel was prophesying back when Nebuchadnezzar was there in like the 7th century B.C. This is a long, long time ago. 
And God is saying that these things were going to be taking place thousands of years in the future. Did, you, did we hear something about that in Isaiah chapter 46? What did God say about God? He said, I am God and there is none like me. I, c- I know the end from the beginning. I can tell you these things if I'd like to. Why does he tell us again? So that we may believe. Because after they come to pass, we can look at it on this side of history and we can say, man, look at that. God was so accurate in the way in which he foretold these things to come to pass. You with me? Daniel 2, you may have heard it before. If not, I would encourage you. Study it is so encouraging, faith building. But you understand this is not the only prophecy in Daniel. There are others. But they're not nearly as hard, and you guys are even going to interpret the third one. Okay? But the second one you find in Daniel chapter 7. And what we find happening in apocalyptic Bible prophecy is the principle of repeating, but enlarging in a certain area. Right? Giving more information. The reason that repetition is there is so that we can understand where we're at. We can actually, oh, 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 I see exactly where we are. So Daniel 2 laid it out plain as day. Daniel 7 starts with beasts. This chapter tells us that the beasts are kingdoms. And there are four of them. How many medals do you see there in the image? One, two, three, four, and then a divided one at the bottom, right? So there's four And then here in Daniel 7, we find four different beasts. So don't be scared of this stuff either. I know people read Daniel Revelation, they think, oh, it's so scary, it's hard to understand. No, it's not. Use the Bible, let it interpret itself. You guys can do this. I believe it. Here's where it begins. Babylon, being the first of these kingdoms, is represented by a lion with wings, whose wings are plucked off. He's given the heart of a man and made to stand on his feet. Interestingly, you'll remember the story of Nebuchadnezzar, who had been made to crawl around like a beast, but then had been made to stand back up on his feet, given the heart of a man again, right? You you understand that this this would have been fresh in, in their mind. In addition to that, you guys could even today travel to Germany and look into, I believe it's the Berlin Museum. Has everybody ever actually been there? Somebody's in a group this big, maybe somebody's been there. Have anybody actually seen the Ishtar Gate in person? Oh, I was hoping somebody would say, I've seen it. The Ishtar Gate is a really interesting uh, example of, what do you call that? Where, where people feel like they can take things that don't belong to them. Stealing. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so, so you had all these, these really well-meaning German archaeologists who went down to places like Babylon, and they were digging around, and they found the in, this entire entrance to the city of Babylon. It's this humongous blue gate. We call it the Ishtar Gate. And they said, I've got a bright idea. I mean, they're not using it, and we think it's pretty cool. So let's take it apart, and let's take it back to Germany, and we'll set it up in a museum. Now, nowadays, that is frowned upon, but it's already in Germany, so it's staying in Germany. Okay, so they rebuilt the Ishtar Gate, and as they're rebuilding it, guess what image you see all over it? Lions with wings would have been very clear that this was representing, again, Babylon. That kingdom wasn't going to last forever. Daniel 2 already told us this. This is just repeating, and then we're enlarging. There was a second beast scene. It was an, a lion, not a lion, a, a bear, hunched up on one side. It was uneven. Did we already see that there was an uneven kingdom in chapter 2? We did, right? Medo-Persia was uneven. Persia was stronger. There were three ribs in its mouth. Typically, Bible historians uh, find that this is the three major kingdoms that Medo-Persia had to conquer in order to become the major world power, which was Egypt, Libya, and Babylon. A really interesting idea. Again, you see it very clearly here, but Medo-Persia wasn't going to be around forever. It was going to be followed by Greece. Greece here is represented as a leopard, which was a very fast animal. Not just any fast animal, but this fast animal was given wings because if you want to make an animal fast, how, how could you make it faster than it already was? Well, maybe give it some wings. It can fly, right? In addition to that, it had four heads. And these are not real animals. You understand, right? You're starting, you look, finally, you look at this and you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. These are not real animals. Good thing the chapter told us these were representative of kingdoms, right? But here we have a four-headed leopard. We'll find out later, and of course history will tell us, that after Alexander died, he did not have a clear heir, and four of his leaders who were underneath him split up the kingdom into four different pieces, right? So here we have four-headed leopard with wings, Greece. The next one, 
Daniel's looking at it, and he's like, I don't even know what this thing is. Because it's a, he says it's a terrible beast. It has ten horns and iron teeth. Iron? Did you see iron anywhere else? Right? We're clearly making the connection with previous chapters, right? So here we have a, a terrible beast, ten horns, and so far, all of this is the same. There's nothing new. But finally, in chapter 7, we do get some new information. Amongst the ten horns, we find a little horn that comes up amongst the ten horns. And it, it, he's little at first. He doesn't seem very powerful, but three other horns are thrown down. Three other kingdoms are thrown down um, when he comes up. We've talked about this in the seven churches before, this period of the 1260-year prophecy, right? And we saw that that was representative, not of, of pagan Rome, but of papal Rome, kind of leading into this confusion where people were no longer clear that they could approach Jesus as a personal savior, right? That was the big problem with the papal system early on. There was a, there was a misunderstanding. There was a putting forth of things. Uh, you could, for instance, understand if you've ever known somebody who was of that persuasion. If you do something wrong, who do you go to? You go to the confessional, right? You don't go to, to Jesus directly. You go to the confessional, and then you're given things to do, which should then buy your forgiveness, as it were. But that's not what Jesus says. In Hebrews chapter 4, he says plainly that we can go where? Directly to the throne of grace. You, friends, can go directly to Jesus today. There's nothing between you and me. You, you, can't, you can come and talk to me about problems you have if you want to, and I can advise you, but do you know what I'm going to advise you to do? To pray and to go directly to Jesus. I, I cannot do anything for you. <laughs> That's not a power that I have. But Jesus Christ can cleanse you by his blood, and so he says, come directly to me. There was some confusion over that, and that little horn power was leading in some of that confusion. Now, Daniel's very interested in this. And so he is like, man, I don't understand. That was new information, but there's one more piece of new information. If you've got your Bibles, Daniel chapter 7. I want, this is the one I really want to key in on. You'll find it there in verse 9. Here's what it says. Daniel chapter 7 in verse 9, he says, I beheld until the thrones were cast down, and ancient, the ancient of days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and his hair of his head was like pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels were of burning fire. A fiery stream issued and came forth before him. Thousand, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. And you, I know already, in our hearts, there's something that trembles when we hear the term judgment, isn't there? Yet, I am going to make the argument for you today that the, the, the judgment of God is not something to be afraid of as a Bible-believing Christian. It is something to welcome, to even call for. It is something exciting that we look forward to. In fact, here is, again, our timeline that I find very interesting. I want to just make sure we're all seeing it. That when this judgment is taking place, he says, books are open, right? We see these books, these different kind of books discussed in different places in Revelation, and in other places as well, the Lamb's Book of Life is a very important one discussed in Revelation chapter 12. You want your name written there. It is written there. You've accepted Jesus as your Savior. Your name is written there. Can I get an amen or a hallelujah or something, right? Now, this is fantastic news. This is good. Like, Jesus wants to save you. He's not looking for reasons to keep you out of heaven. He is doing all that is within his power to make you a partaker of eternal life with him. He loves you. Friends, what we see here in Daniel chapter 7 that sometimes people see as scary as the judgment is very, very, it's the opposite of scary. It's something that we ought to be looking for. Now, I, I also want you to understand that this is not the end of that vision. Although there is this judgment where there is an open book. And by the way, all these watching, these, these heavenly agencies are around him looking into these things, they are seeing for themselves that God is who he says he is. You know, that's what basically most of this argument's been about. Way back in the Garden of Eden, you can see it. Satan was there, and he said, God's not who he says he is. God says he's love, and God says he's looking out for you. But, ah, uh, no, 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 friends. That's not who he is. 
And the argument that he is putting forth there in the garden is the same argument he had in heaven. He has always been trying to portray God as somebody he is not. And God, for his part, is saying, I, I really am. I do love you. I mean, look at my son. He's the best picture of me that I, I, I can give, right? And, and he's willing to die for your sins. Friends, this is good news. This is great. This is fantastic. And so the judgment is, again, not something that's scary. There is, uh, you can find there also in verse 20, 26 of the same chapter, the same statement again about the interpretation of the judgment. The judgment shall, shall sit, and they shall take away the dominion of the little horn to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And then, verse 27 says, the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. When, when, when do we get the kingdom? Before or after the judgment? After. So the judgment takes place before the kingdom is given. Now, notice here in chapter 2, the kingdom was given at the second coming of Jesus Christ. His kingdom comes, and he, he actually starts this thing up, right? So here in chapter 7, he's just letting us know that there is going to be some looking into books prior to a coming with his reward. You know, Revelation chapter 22, Jesus says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Do you understand that? His reward is with him, which means he's already made his decisions. Everybody else has been able to look into this thing that needed to look into this thing, right? The heavenly agencies are sure, because Satan had, had tried to confuse them too. And they have they've now looked into this, they've investigated it, if you want to say that, whatever the case might be, and, they, and they've seen that God is who he says he is, and they're saying, yes, hallelujah. Let's go and get them. And they do. All of heaven is emptied, according to Revelation. All of heaven comes, and they say, let's, let's go and get them. And Jesus, in many parables, tells how the angels would go and gather people to Jesus Christ. Friends, be, I, I am so looking forward to that day. Now, we're hastening forward here because there is yet a third vision. I want you guys to interpret it for me. It's in Daniel chapter 8. Okay? In Daniel chapter 8, the first thing you see is a ram with two horns, but one horn is bigger than the other one. Have you seen in these two chapters a beast or a power that is uneven represented? Medo-Persia? Okay, let's just say that that's the case for now. Okay, let's say that the ram with two horns is Medo-Persia. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check it, because the Bible's actually going to tell us, but we'll check it. Okay, the next one, it says that there is a he-goat with one great horn. He comes from the west, and he goes so fast towards the east that his feet don't touch the ground. When your feet don't touch the ground, what is, what is it called? You're flying. He's going so fast, he's flying with one great horn pushing forward. Is there another power that we saw in these previous chapters that was moving so fast it was flying, that was represented by one great, great king at the beginning? Anybody understand? It? Greece. Greece. So we're going to say that it was Greece. So now if you've got your Bible open to Daniel chapter 8, I want to, you know, Daniel wanted to know too. And so heaven sent a messenger named Gabriel who is supposed to give him this message. Verse 20, he's giving the message, and he says, The ram which you saw, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. Hey, you're right. You got it. You used principles of Bible interpretation of repeat and enlarge, and you knew exactly which kingdom that was, and, the, and heaven agreed with you. Verse 21, let's just make sure we're, we're right on the next one, too. It says, And the rough goat is the king of, king of Greece. The great horn which you saw between its eyes is the first king, which was who? Alexander the Great. Guys, isn't that exciting? Because Jesus told us, and keep in mind when this was written, by the way. Keep in mind when this was written. Like hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus was born, this was written. Jesus, in John chapter 14, verse 29, said, Behold, I have told you before it comes to pass, so that after it passes, you may believe. Do you see that? Do you see that God gives us the proof of predictive prophecy so that we may have a firm foundation for our faith? I, I look at these things and I think, man, God is awesome. 
This is amazing. He further goes on in the vision, and we see the little horn show up again. We saw the little horn back here. This time, the little horn has two different kind of, uh, of things. First, the, the, we see the four divisions of Greece, and then the little horn comes out, and he has a horizontal period of growth, and then he has a vertical period of growth. I know it's a weird picture, Heidi. I see your face. <laughs> right, okay, anyway, I didn't make the picture. I just used it because I thought it was useful. So this little horn grows horizontally, which would be the pagan Roman Empire basically taking over, right? But then there is a vertical ascent, and it says there's an attack made on the daily, which is, it starts to use sanctuary language. These are sanctuary animals. There's all this information that we ought to be looking at going, but it's, why is he bringing up the sanctuary so much? Why is, he, why is this power attacking the daily? What is the daily all about? Well, it's about the sacrifice Jesus made for us and how we can go to him directly and receive pardon for our sins. Well, this little horn power got in the way of that and for a long time confused people as to whether or not we could go to God directly. So, friends, what I want you to know again, if you have a problem, a sin problem maybe, an issue, where should you go? Should you come and talk to me about it? What am I going to do if you do come talk to me about it? I'm going to point you to Jesus. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to encourage you to pray. Because where is the only place that you can find cleansing from your sin? In Jesus Christ, friends. And so we have here, that is very clear, and we even get this picture given that Jesus, as our great high priest, has a work to do. I want you to read there in Daniel chapter 8, starting in verse 13 with me, and see the climax of the chapter 8 vision. Here's what it says. Then I heard one speaking and another one listening, and that one said, How long shall this vision concerning be concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both sanctuary and the host to be trampled on? All right. The question is, how long? How long? So what would you expect as an answer? A time frame, right? And so the next verse says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And you go, sanctuary? What are we talking about here? This could be so confusing, except that we understand in the Old Testament there is a sanctuary that gives us a lot of information, right? Do you guys remember the Old Testament sanctuary? It was like this little tent in the desert there, and there were, it, it was representative of certain things, right? In fact, if you remember in Hebrews chapter 2 through 8, you basically find that the whole burden of the book of Hebrews is to show that Jesus is your high priest, not me, okay? It's Jesus. Further, it says in chapter 8 that there is a literal sanctuary in heaven, and that Jesus, as our great high priest, is ministering on our behalf, which means that today, Jesus is thinking about who? Thank you for using a personal pronoun. He's thinking about me. And, and you all ought to say the same thing. Jesus, today, is thinking about me. Man, can you imagine the creator of the universe, the redeemer, is thinking about us today. Hallelujah. Now, in, in the sanctuary, which each one of these things is representing a part of Jesus' ministry, think about, for instance, the Passover represented the death of Jesus on our behalf, right? And then the, and then the, the, the priest would take that blood and he would go and, and minister every single day in the sanctuary. Jesus is our high priest. He goes and does these things. But once a year... There was a special day towards the end of the calendar year when the high priest, this only day of the year, when the high priest would go not into the holy place, but into the second apartment, as it were, going through a door into the most holy place, and they're ministering on a special day called, I think they, we, we probably might know it as Yom Kippur. You guys ever heard of Yom Kippur? People still recognize that as a day, right? Now, I want to ask you, do you know the English name of it? The Day of Atonement. It's a made-up name. Do you know that? It's a made-up name because it's just descriptive. Do you know what atonement means? It's, it's at 
one men. It's a state of being at one. The whole purpose of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, was at the end of the day, you were to be at one with God. Can you imagine God wants that? What in the world? Like, what? This is not a God like, the, like the, the pagan gods that we have heard and read about. This is totally different. The God of the Bible wants you to be at one with him. He loves you, and he wants you to be a part of his family. Hallelujah. This is amazing. And so here, once a year, in the antitypical part, it was portraying what Jesus' real ministry would be, and he was to enter into that. Now, we got a time period, but how many of you know exactly what the 2300 days is pointing towards if that was all you have? If all you had was chapter 8, you don't know a whole lot, and the reason you don't know a whole lot is because as the angel actually comes to give him the interpretation, and he does, he says, I've come to give you understanding, he then says this wonderful explanation about the 2300 days. Are you ready for the explanation? Here's what he says. The vision of the evening and the morning, which was told, is true. Verse 26, period. Good explanation. Boy, I wish you'd have told me a little bit more. I'd really like a little bit more, please, because I'm a little confused. Cleansing the sanctuary seems to be an important event. Uh, it, at the end of that, I mean, it's this thing that, that we're so looking forward to. By the way, all of Israel understood that this was a day of judgment, which you, you can see the connection there, right? Okay, all the way through. We're seeing this judgment taking place. We're seeing that the day of atonement is associated with the judgment prior to when he actually executes the judgment and says, I am coming with my rewards. Right? How, do, how does that happen, by the way? If you are going to give a reward to somebody, don't you, you first kind of look into things? Right? And then, when the decision is made, you present it. Right? So, the, the, the judgment or the investigation of these things takes place prior to when the judgment is executed. So sometimes we look at the judgment as actually having different parts. Instead of it being one particular thing, which most people understand that the judgment is at the end of the world, Jesus comes, and then all of a sudden this, this thing happens as a judgment. But Jesus says, I am coming and my reward is with me, which means what's happened? It's already been done before he comes. A pre-advent judgment. <laughs> it's very interesting. Very interesting. And so you're at the end of chapter 8 and you're going, well, that's all good and well, but I don't know what is going on. And I want you to know that you're in good company because Daniel says this in verse 27. I, Daniel, fainted and was sick. <laughs> Afterward, I rose up. I did the king's business, but I was astonished at the vision and nobody understood. Now, now the angel had told him specific names. What wasn't to be understood? Well, that part about the time. There's actually a specific word used that connects this that I, I, maybe we could go into in a deeper study. But there's different words for the vision. That's the total vision and just the time vision. But what you find is that at the end of chapter 8, Daniel's confused about a time vision. So guess what happens in chapter 9? It starts with him being confused about a time vision. <laughs> Right? So he left chapter 8, confused about a time vision, and then he starts chapter 9 investigating the time vision. He's trying to understand this, this vision from Jeremiah where it was only supposed to be a certain period of time. They were in captivity. And now he says, God, are you going to keep us here longer? What's going on? And he's praying, and he says, God, don't delay. And he has no vision in chapter 9. And yet, when the angel Gabriel comes to him, he says, in verse 21, While I was speaking in prayer, even then the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, flew to me swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening sacrifice, and he informed me, and he said, Daniel, I've come to give you skill and understanding. Daniel's praying, what does this vision have to do with my people? Guess what the angel comes and gives him understanding about? What the vision has to do with his people? You guys have your have your seatbelts on, right, and, and thinking caps and all that stuff, okay? We're, 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 just, we're just going flying, and I'm hoping that all you guys are doing maybe is some dots being connected, but perhaps you're also seeing that Jesus has told us these things ahead of time so that we may what? Believe. Here's what Jesus 
is then revealing from heaven through his messenger in the I'm going to wait on that. I'm going to explain it first because I've got another picture for you, but you won't understand it unless I tell you about it first. Okay? In chapter 9, the angel comes and he tells him about the portion of time that is cut off for his people. The word there is specific. Chatak. It even sounds like being cut. Right? (laughs) It's cut off from the larger time period. And it's specifically for Daniel's people. And he says it's 70 weeks. Who's good at math? How many days is 70 weeks? 490. Good. 70 times 7 is still 490. I was worried for a minute. But 490 is there our time period we're looking at. It's cut off from the 2300 days. It is a period that we can see a part of and get more information. And I want you just to, just to pause there for a minute. And I want you to notice what happens We're given a time period here in chapter 9. And if you're there, you can see it plain as day. Here's what he says. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the anointed one, the prince, shall be 69 weeks. He's telling you, where do you start counting? From the time the the decree goes out. Start counting. Now, we archaeologically have found when that decree went out. We can find it biblically when that decree went out. It went out in 457 B.C. That was our period where we're starting counting. And he says, start counting forward. Count forward 483 years. And I'm going to tell you why it's years in a minute. There is a principle in Bible prophecy, which we're going to check right now, called the day for a year principle. You find it in places like Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, and in Numbers chapter 14, verse 34, where God himself is speaking, and he says, I am going to lay on you a day for a year. It's actually a prophetic statement that he makes, and he says, for every day there shall be a year. And so when we're here, and he says there's 490 days, we are going to interpret that prophetically as 490 years. We're going to move forward 69 of those weeks and get to 27 A.D. or A.D. 27. Why in the world are we at A.D. 27? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it said that you should find Messiah the Prince there, the Anointed One. When was Jesus? And so a lot of people say, well, Jesus wasn't born in A.D. 27. No, he wasn't. But how, when was Jesus anointed? The book of Acts tells us that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit at his baptism. Well, when was he baptized? That is the only date we have from the ministry of Jesus given to us as the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. You can look it up. He started reigning in AD 12. 15 years forward gets you to what? AD 27. Wait a minute. Didn't we say AD 27 somewhere else? Back there in Daniel chapter 9, it said if you go there, you will find the anointing of the prince. Messiah will be there. And then it goes further and says, there's in one more week, we'll confirm the covenant with many for a week, but in the middle of the week, he'll be cut off, but not for himself. Was Jesus' ministry three and a half years? Yes. Was he cut off, as it were? Did he give his life, not for himself, but for others? Yes, friends, he did. This is so exciting, because without we've confirmed the starting date we've confirmed and found jesus now all we need to do is go well what in the world was the rest of that 2300 days about because I, I i'm very curious i was confused in chapter eight daniel was confused in chapter eight and so i'm going to put up a really cool picture you just have to digest it for a minute are you ready okay so over here you got 457 bc right up here is the 490 week or the 490 year prophecy you find jesus being anointed there, baptized in AD 27, crucified there, Stephen stoned there. At that point, it says they were dispersed and going and giving the message not to the Jews alone where Jesus had told them to be, but now to give the message unto the rest of the world. That is awesome. Confirmed. So what happens then? We move forward the rest of the 2300 years and we get to AD 1844 and you're going, what in the world is 1844 about? This doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't unless you're in the seven churches. 
You knew it was going to get there at some point, right? Had to, we had to make our way back to the seven churches somehow. We have been looking at the seven churches with eight, I mean, we've, we've been exhausted. We've been spending a week on each one of these churches. And finally, we are all the way down to the sixth church, which is Philadelphia. We've seen that these, these churches each are a time frame for the Christian era. We've been studying that in depth. If that's new to you at all and you're going, what, well, huh? Then please go to YouTube and check the sermons, right? right? Or come and find me and I'll try and lay it out in as best a way as I can as well. But what we find is our last one, Sardis, we left in the early, eight, in the early 19th century, early 1800s. In that time period, we finally find a revival taking place, not just in America, but all over the world. People started to look at a time prophecy. Can you guess what that time prophecy was? It was the time prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. What they thought was that the cleansing of the sanctuary was the second coming of Jesus. Now, I just want to remind you, there was no such thing as a Seventh-day Adventist at that, at that point, right? Just in case anybody ever confuses you or you're confused about that. The movement in America was led by a Baptist pastor by the name of William Miller. You're just with me, right? Okay. So what, there, was some, there was a little bit of confusion about, and there was, a bunch of other, there was a bunch of other people who were involved as well. It was not one denomination. It was a multi-denominational thing, conglomeration of people who, guess what? We're just really excited about the coming of Jesus. And so what I want you to see there in the description given of them in Revelation chapter 3 is the following. So you're there in Revelation chapter 3, the message to Philadelphia, and something amazing is being said. Jesus is addressing them, and he says, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, which by the way means brotherly love, this is, a, this is the city of brotherly love, and he is addressing them, and he, this is one of two churches that does not have anything bad about them. He only has good things to say about them. This is amazing. But unfortunately, it's a very short time in Christian history. It really only lasts about a dozen years or so. But what happens is, he says, he turns to them, he says, I am the one who has all authority. Did he say that to another group of people, by the way? Who was supposed to go and take a message out? He did. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the kids are learning this in Sabbath school right now. He says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, right? Isn't that the message of the Great Commission? And yet here what we find is Jesus says, I have the key of David. If you look back at what this is a reference to, a gentleman was given the key of David. He was given the authority of the kingdom. Jesus is saying, I have the authority of the kingdom. You can trust me. Can you trust Jesus? You can trust Jesus today, friends. He says in verse 8, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door, which no man can shut, for you have only a little strength. You're just a little group. But you've kept my word and you haven't denied my name. That open door that is set before them is looking back, clearly seen as this transitional period where Jesus' ministry is developing. You can see this also show up in Revelation chapter 14, which is another great end time passage where he says the first angel's message. What does it say? Somebody remind me. Revelation chapter 14 and verse 7. Flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, saying, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of... What? The hour of what? The hour of his judgment is at hand. Friends, this time period in Revelation is associated with an open door and a judgment taking place. When did that happen? In the sanctuary. On the Day of Atonement. Oh my goodness, this is amazing. I mean, like when I first started to connect all of these dots, to me, I was sitting there and going, this is amazing. Like Jesus knew all about this stuff and he told me before it happened because he knew I was going to be too hard-headed to do anything about it before it happened, but then I would look back and what would happen in me, in my heart? What would happen in my heart? I would believe my faith would be strengthened and I would be... I would just say, Jesus, you're wonderful. We have a wonderful God. You know, friends, this is what we ought to be about. And that little group there in Philadelphia that's talked about is just a small little group. They really were small. 
You know, they, they were so committed. They, they had a love for one another and for God that has probably not been rivaled since then. There is just a sense of, of, of excitement about the coming of Jesus Christ that was about them. Friends, that we need. We need that. And that is my encouragement to you. Because here we find more sanctuary knowledge in Revelation chapter 3. When you are told what awaits you if you find yourself in a Philadelphia-like situation. Here is what Jesus says. Verse 12. Him that overcomes will I make a pillar in the temple of God. More sanctuary language. And he shall go out no more, and I will write upon him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. I will write upon him the name, my new name. Him that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Friends, you know what Jesus wants, is, is saying here? I want to claim you as my own. Right? Isn't that what you do? When you were a kid and you, your mama wrote your name in the back of your jacket. What did that mean? It meant that's yours. Don't anybody else take it. Jesus is like, I'm going to write my name on you. <laughs> You're mine. I paid for you with my life. I love you. You've responded to my love. This is what we're about. Oh, man. If, if any of this was uh, like drinking from a fire hydrant from you today, it's okay, all right? We can, we can, we can understand. We can unpack later. But I, what I want you to know is Jesus loves you very much. And he has given us these things so that we may look back and see that he is exactly who he says he is. He's a good God. And friends, he wants you to believe. He wants you to have faith, to respond to his love. W what would you say today? Do you want to respond to him today? Then I'm going to pray to close, and you can tell him that in your heart right now, okay? Father in heaven, God, we are so grateful. We're grateful that we have a God who is so wonderful, so magnificent, can see the end from the beginning and decides to unveil it to us even though he, you, you know that we're too stubborn to actually do anything about it most of the time. But then when we look back and we see it clearly through the eyes of history, you knew and you said, now you'll believe. God, many of us have, have seen your word as, as, as much as we uh, unpacked today, Lord, we've seen it, and it has been something that has inspired belief in us. We want to respond to you again today, right now, and just tell you, Lord, we love you. We want to receive you into our lives. You are our God, whom we've waited for, and you will save us. Thank you, Father. We are looking forward to seeing you oh so very soon. Lord, we pray that you'd walk with us day by day. We are little of strength. Yet, Lord, make us into pillars. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.